Wound coverage techniques for the injured extremity. This is part two of our uh, lecture from the OTA core, cur core curriculum resident lecture series version three. Uh, these slides are authored by Dr. Gil Ortega and previously by Dr. David Sanders. Uh, I'm Saka Brahman narrating and I'm also reading some of their uh, notes to the slides. And in the first video we covered mostly some introductory stuff and skin grafts. Uh, in this video, we're going to talk about the basics of flaps, rotational flaps, and then we'll, in the last video, get into free flaps. So, when you have a good recipient bed, well vascularized, no exposed cartilage tendon uh, implants, then you can do a skin graft. But when you have those things uh, present, then skin graft may not work, and uh, you may have to consider a flap, especially if you have a larger areas. Uh, or deeper area, uh, dead space, um, etc. So um, there's several classifications um, for soft tissue flaps and you know, McGregor uh, back in 72 introduced the concept of random and axial flaps and this is terms that you're gonna uh, hear uh, when you discuss flaps. So a random flap is basically a flap that lacks any significant bias in its vascular pattern. So without a definitive recognized arteriovenous system, elevation of the flap is generally restricted. Um, so that is the length of the flap to be raised um, when you have to harvest this should be no greater than the width of the base of the flap that's providing the necessary blood flow through that uh, subdermal plexus because it's random. You don't know where it's coming from. It's, it's really just, um, and, and you can devascularize if you go past that. So if you need to extend the length of a random flap, there are some other techniques you can do. Uh, won't get too much into like uh, delay techniques, you make parallel incisions, and try to channel the blood flow uh, into your flap to then come back and extend the length that you can elevate. But um, we'll move on. So axial flaps are a single pedicled flap that has an anatomically recognized arteriovenous system running along its long axis. So uh, an axial flap is basically not restricted to that same one-to-one -one ratio of flap elevation that you are uh, that you're given with a random flap. So flaps can also be classified as either local or distant uh, on the basis of their, of their proximity to the donor site uh, or proximity of the donor site to the recipient site. So a local flap uh, can be further categorized by the nature of their pedicle into like an advancement or rotation flap. All right, so so further classification of soft tissue flaps. So as, as knowledge of skin vascularity has increased over the years, the incorporation of tissues other than skin and just subcutaneous tissues and coverage of bigger defects has become more successful. So uh, by default, there's this nomenclature system um, developed uh, that's based on flap composition, right? So terms like cutaneous, fascia cutaneous, myocutaneous are used to describe the incorporation of skin, fascia, or muscle in your flap. And then eventually other structures such as bone, nerve, tendon have been incorporated into you know, the flaps that are available, and those are compound flaps. So since most flaps are designed around a tissue's vascular pedicle, uh, probably the most justified method of classification is one based on the flap's vascular origin. So it's now accepted that there are these three basic patterns of blood supply. So direct cutaneous, musculocutaneous, and septocutaneous. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about in the next couple of slides. So direct cutaneous flap has arteries that run immediately above the muscle and fascia in the subdermal fat with a specific directional orientation. So an excellent example of a direct cutaneous flap is a groin flap that's supplied by the superficial um, circumflex iliac artery. And this unfortunate individual had to have his hand um, covered, uh, presumably temporarily, uh, with this uh, groin flap. Uh, so muscle flaps have been uh, categorized uh, by Mathis um, and uh, 
uh, they've been categorized according to the five muscle types depending, uh, depending on their vascular anatomy. So each pattern has significance for arc of rotation skin territory, whether it can be elevated as a distally based flap and whether it can be elevated as a free flap. Okay, so a type 1 flap has one dominant pedicle. So uh, they can't be raised as a distally based rotation flap uh, because there are no secondary vessels um, perforating distally. So examples are gastrocnemius, uh, tensor fascia lata. So type 2 flaps can be raised as free flaps on the dominant proximal vessel or as distally based rotational flaps based on one of the smaller pedicles entering along the course of the muscle. So um, for instance, brachioradialis is based on a dominant perforator off the radial artery in the mid-substance of the muscle. Uh, gracilis is supplied by the anterior branch of the obturator artery. Soleus is supplied by a branch off the posterior tibial artery. Um, whereas type 3 has two dominant vessels that allow for rotation from either end. So a rectus flap is supplied by the deep inferior epigastric, which is the dominant vessel and will reliably supply the entire muscle. And the superior epigastric artery will reliably support the upper two-thirds of the muscle. So that's one example. Gluteus maximus is supplied by superior and inferior gluteal arteries. So the inferior gluteal artery um, is dominant, uh, but an excellent intramuscular vascular connection allows the gluteus to be supplied by either vessels and these vessels are separated by the piriformis muscle as they exit the, the pelvis. If, if you've looked at the you know, anatomy when you, when you do a hip, for instance. So type 4 muscles are generally not used for soft tissue reconstruction because uh, they lack a distinct pedicle and can't be rotated reliably on these multiple small perforating branches. And type 5 uh, flap has a dominant pedicle uh, which allows them to be elevated as a free flap or a rotation flap. So since there's a segmental blood supply um, to the muscle at the distal end, half of the muscle can be harvested on the dominant pedicle while the remainder of the muscle is nourished from the segmental vascular pedicle. So these are flaps you probably heard of, right? Or certainly the latissimus. So the latissimus flap is kind of a workhorse muscle flap for soft tissue coverage. Um, and it's an example of a type 5 um, uh, muscle. So septocutaneous flaps have arteries which traverse between the overlying muscles and distinct intramuscular septi and therefore are known as septocutaneous vessels. Um, and subcutaneous flaps uh, are classified into four types based on the location and number of vascular pedicles as well as flap composition. So, a type A flap is a pedicled flap containing fascia and skin that depends on multiple fasciocutaneous perforators at the base uh, and that is oriented along uh, with the long axis of the flap at the level of the deep fascia. So type B is excuse me, based on a single fasciocutaneous perforator of moderate size consistent in presence and location. So this is a pedicled or free flap uh, depending on, upon a single and consistent fasciocutaneous perforator off of an artery feeding uh, plexus at the level of the deep fascia. Uh, the sural uh, artery fasciocutaneous flap is supplied by the last perforator of the perineal artery which can be found approximately five to seven centimeters above the lateral malleolus. We'll talk about this in the next video. The parascapular flap is based on the parascapular branch of the circumflex scapular artery. So remember, these flaps are all supplied by well-defined perforating vessels. So here you can see an example of a distally based sural artery flap with the pedicle easily visualized. So a type C flap is supported by multiple small perforators along its length, uh, which reach it from a deep artery uh, by passing along a fascial septum. Uh, so the radial forearm flap um, was one of the first of this type to be described, and it's um, somewhat of a workhorse uh, in, the, in the upper extremity. Let's show that again later as well. So a type D um, 
is a compound flap which incorporates uh, other structures such as muscle or bone. So a radial forearm flap, for instance, can be raised with half of the diameter of the radius. Uh, or a fibular osteocutaneous flap uh, can be used as well as which is shown here in the uh, in the image. All right, so we're going to pause here and uh, we'll uh, finish up in the next video with uh, free tissue transfer or free flaps. Thank you.